Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for more participants to arrive before we start today's event, so just bear with us. So we're just waiting for a few more participants to come in and then I will stop the event, so just bear with us. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm delighted and excited to welcome you to the first Staffordshire Ambassador Meeting. For those of you that I haven't met before, I'm Hannah Alt, Director of Valentine Clays, a Staffordshire Chamber of Commerce Board Member, a Local Enterprise Partnership Board Member, and also the Chair of the newly formed Place Board. I'll explain a little bit about this in a minute. It's brilliant to see so many representatives from Staffordshire-based businesses and organisations joining us this afternoon on what will be our first of bi-monthly Staffordshire Ambassador meetings. If we are going to grow a successful Staffordshire, if we are going to rebuild after coronavirus, we are going to have to do that together and your support is going to be absolutely crucial we are stronger together than as a single voice. Growing a prosperous Staffordshire is the heart of this new place approach and is something that we all now really need to focus on. Where all businesses and organisations need to come together to make it our responsibility to deliver the Staffordshire story and to get our powerful countywide message out there. Over the past few months, we've already been on a fantastic and inspiring journey, which I truly believe will play a significant part in making Staffordshire a destination of choice and enabling us to become even more passionate and proud of what is an extraordinary place. I'm conscious that many of you won't know who I am, what I do, and why I'm so excited about this initiative. I am what you call a real Stokey, having been born and bred in Stoke-on-Trent with the back stamp to prove it. My background has been predominantly in marketing communications, having worked for international companies such as Prada and Arcadia in London, American Eagle Outfitters in New York, and most notably Emma Bridgewater in Staffordshire. Six years ago, I'm extremely proud to say that I joined Valentine Clays Limited, a clay manufacturer that distributes Staffordshire-made produce throughout the world. It was established over 40 years ago by my dad and grandfather, and I'm excited to be part of the next generation of the business, focusing on development and growth with a 4 million expansion plan. Part of this plan has been to develop our own ceramic center called Love Clay, which hosts a ceramic studio that runs courses, and a gallery and exhibition space giving access to contemporary ceramics. We are currently in the process of building a new production facility too, with the aim to meet the current demands of the ceramic industry worldwide. Our distinctive buildings based on our main colour themes and our fired hand sculpture, which sit at a major gateway in Stoke-on-Trent, are something that I believe Staffordshire can be proud of all of which is aimed to help to promote the importance of clay, not only to Staffordshire, but beyond. This, along with my involvement with organisations such as the Staffordshire Chamber of Commerce, the Local Enterprise Partnership, 
as chair of the Growing Business Subgroup that helps to deliver a local industrial strategy and chairing the Growth Hub Steering Group, I hope to demonstrate the passion I have for my county and how my focus is upon helping local businesses and organisations to grow. To do this, and what forms part of my Marcoms background, is the acknowledgement that one of the most important things our county can do is to tell our strong and successful story. I mentioned that I am chair of the newly formed Place Board, which aims to be a leadership group who will be guardians of the Staffordshire story and brand and the ultimate champions of the county, especially outside of it. This small group of enthusiasts are passionate about Staffordshire and are going to use their leadership, energy, ideas, contacts and insights to promote the place at every opportunity and hopefully inspire others to do the same. I am extremely proud and humbled to have this role and will be giving it everything so this initiative is the success we need it all to be. Today's event is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. And whilst you have your phone and tablets to hand, it would be great if you could show your support and make your voice heard by tweeting as we go along using the hashtag WeAreStaffordshire. As a reminder and a recap, I just want to go, I just want to start by going back to where this all started who's been involved, what we've achieved together to date, and what the plans are going forward. There was a consensus among leaders from businesses, universities, and the public sector that Staffordshire was punching well below its weight. That the reality of the place is way better than its image, and that our potential was not being recognised. It was agreed that Staffordshire should develop a forward-looking place story, at the heart of a new place-led marketing approach for the county. To create this, one of the largest pieces of stakeholder engagement in recent times took place across the geography and the sectors of the county, undertaken by, by place experts, thinking place, who have been advising us. The aim of this initiative is to get as many people and organisations behind the approach as possible and telling and selling the Staffordshire story. So here is a reminder of what it is. Our story articulates the distinctiveness, character and characteristics of Staffordshire, highlighting what makes us special and the opportunities for the development and promotion of the county. This overarching narrative consists of themes which are pillars and chapters of the story and a big idea that is the emotional purpose for the place. They represent what needs to be focused on for Staffordshire to prosper. The theme areas combine elements that are already important in the place, alongside its potential and lesser known ingredients of the Staffordshire experience. The first theme is active, adventurous and fun. Staffordshire is a mecca for those who love the great outdoors, whether for adrenaline sports or an amble. A place of many glorious settings from the Peak District National Park, the Trent and Mersey Canal, from Canic Chase to one of my favourites, the Roaches. There's something for all ages and all abilities. Staffordshire is also first for fun with Alton Towers, the Snow Dome and Go Ape to name just a few. This is Attraction Central. The second theme, inspiring, and applying, um, applying ingenuity, ingenuity. This has always been a place of pioneers in innovation, manufacture and design. As business evolves, it will harness this spirit of enterprise and smaller knowledge-driven businesses scattered across the county, responding to the need for lifestyle working in great location. Alongside this, the major brands should such as JCB and Moog will continue to play a major role in the economy. Whilst the universities will fuel entrepreneurialism in everything from gaming to agri-tech. The final, final theme is cherishing our natural livability. Staffordshire defines livability with a fantastic choice of where to put down your roots. From market towns to city living, 
alongside the health and well-being of green spaces, wonderful woodlands and big skies. This is a place of stories, from pottery to brewing beer and interwoven tapestry that defines place and people. The natural and self a safe environment provides a wonderful place to grow a family with great education and a real sense of community. The big idea is Staffordshire Natural Valued Centre. Staffordshire is a great place of great value to the communities within it and the cities that surround it because of its green quality of life, attractions, activities, and special places to live and work. It is a place of signif national significance from the National Memorial Arboretum, National Football Centre, the National Park, the National Forest, and National Brewery Centre. It is location, landscape, and livability. It's affordable, affordable. it's is health and well-being. It is innovative, ingenious, it is valued and valuable. It is, and we are Staffordshire. As you can hear, we have a fantastic story to tell. This leads me on to explaining a bit more about the Staffordshire Ambassador Programme. We're extremely fortunate to already have many individuals and companies who are quietly great ambassadors for Staffordshire, who promote the place, speak up for it, and want to be part of taking the area forward. Some will be speaking later today. We want to build on the fantastic work these individuals and companies are doing by creating a Team Staffordshire approach. We want to create a place network that gives businesses and other organisations the chance to come together to learn about the development of our place, to see how they can play a part and create relationships that benefit themselves and the area. This will provide a high quality opportunity for us to come together to understand and support the place. The purpose of the programme will, will, will be to bring businesses and organisations together to really put Staffordshire firmly on the map. We have a great story to tell and we have so much to be proud of, but it needs all of us to be doing this together to all act as ambassadors for Staffordshire and to cascade the story about this wonderful county. The Staffordshire ambassadors will be regularly informed about developments in the area through the bi-monthly ambassador meetings. COVID has altered how we will run these meetings, but when the time is right, we will hold these in some of Staffordshire's finest and quirkiest venues and buildings. I'm delighted to be joined by some amazing people who will be able to share with you some of the exciting developments and projects that are happening in Staffordshire and how you and your organisation can get involved. The format for today will be three presentations from Chris Langdon, Development and Investment Director UK and Ireland at NG, Peter Coleman, CEO at Cobra Biologics, Fiona Adams, Head of Procurement at Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. After all the speakers have spoken, we'll be inviting them all back to join a panel to answer any questions that you would like to ask. So please, during the sessions, don't forget to use the Q&A function, ask your questions, and we hope to cover many of these at the end. I would like to welcome our first guest, Chris Langdon. Chris is the Development Investment Director UK of Ireland and NG, and will be updating us on the landmark redevelopment of the Rugeley site, a former coal power station into 2,000 low carbon homes and much more. Over to you, Chris. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. That's a, a great intro. Um, so really, um, I'm here today to talk about what we are uh, as a business and uh, doing in Staffordshire, um, why we think it's a, a great place uh, to, to, to work and do that business, and, and most importantly, uh, why we think a very strong and coherent narrative uh, around the place is, is so very uh, valuable um, to, 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 to us all, really. Um, I'm also very hopeful that this session in itself will uh, help establish some new networks, uh, strengthen existing relationships and, and, and build some more of that common ground that I think is uh, 
uh, really critical in, 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 in developing that identity. So a little bit about who, who we are and who I am. Uh, that's my uh, pre-lockdown uh, 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 photograph. Um, we, we as a, an organization have a, a, a very central um, conviction, which is around leading the zero carbon transition. So that kind of defines uh, a, a, a lot of what we do. We, we, we recognize that there is a relationship between carbon emissions, between climate change, biodiversity, human well-being, uh, and indeed some of the uh, risks, challenges and opportunities uh, around uh, society at large and, and economic activity. So with that in mind, we sort of established a, a, a business model um, founded on some of these, these principles, these pillars uh, of low carbon uh, energy. So we produce something like 2.2 gigawatts of low carbon generation. Uh, we manage 25 million square meters of, of space on a sort of energy and services basis. And we have uh, an extensive network of regeneration, development, uh, new build uh, uh, and retrofit uh, activity that come together really to provide what we think is a, a, a um, uh, that, that systems based thinking uh, around achieving system change and, and, and transformation. Um, in terms of Staffordshire itself, this is a site uh, that we own in, in Staffordshire. Uh, it's in Rugeley. It spans Litchfield uh, District uh, Council and Cannock Chase District Council. It's in the south uh, of Staffordshire County. Uh, and as you can see, it typifies much of uh, what people can think about when they think of Staffordshire, certainly the, about the natural livability and the, 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 the environment that uh, Hannah was talking about. If we zoom out, uh, we see the same site, but a slightly different perspective on it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the lake uh, was at the top right hand corner and it is of course a coal fired power station. This picture was taken at the same time. It was taken in uh, 2017. And I think again, it typifies a lot of what, what, what are the values are within the, within the county uh, in relation to productivity, energy generation, uh, manufacturing and the natural environment. Um, the site sits next to the river, had easy, easy access to coal. There's great transport links that go uh, north towards Stafford, uh, link into London and, and, and south in, in, into Birmingham as well. Now, <clears throat> another perspective. Um, this is a, a photograph I took early one morning on a, on a run. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite poignant this week for two reasons. One is the, uh, the central chimney that can be seen in the middle is no longer there. That was uh, actually demolished um, a, a, a week uh, ago. Um, and the reason I took this photograph is because it really dominates the, the town skyline. You can see there's the church, there's the cooling towers, and then there's the chimney. And overnight, uh, that chimney uh, is no longer um, there. And I think one of the important things that I was trying to get across with this with this image is that the uh, the identity of a place is so important to its sense of self and its future story. And we spent an awful lot of time talking about the future story, which I'll come on to in a moment, about what was going to happen once we change the the the, the very visible uh, the very visible landscape. And of course, as we know, coal is hardly a sustainable uh, activity, and that was the underlying um, problem. So what we started to do in our approach with reimagining how um, uh, the, 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 the Rugeley Power Station site could contribute, we started working on principles around working with nature, so biodiversity, working with the grain were absolutely central principles uh, to what we were doing. Um, energy production based on, 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 on something that was very much clean, very much sustainable, that tapped into that existing heritage of uh, a very sort of proud uh, and generative um, uh, uh, e economic environment. And also to start telling a story about what future investment and aspiration might look like um, as, we, as we think about um, not just a post-COVID world, but uh, meeting the, 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 the more existential challenges around climate change. So the first thing that we, we, we did was, was start um, uh, the, the, the very intensive engagement with the local authorities, with the county, with the enterprise partnerships, uh, and very importantly, with all of the local businesses and, and local residents, former employees of the power station, everybody had, had really been involved in that, that, that kind of ecosystem. In particular, there was one story that really, really stands out for me that typifies uh, a little bit of what I'm trying to get across, which was an old um, engineer, a former employee at the power station, and it was at one of the community engagement weekends, and this, this chap was in tears. 
And he was in tears, in tears because he was so proud of the work that they had done while the station had been functioning. It was one of the most efficient power stations in the UK. It consistently came top in the leagues. It, it, it was a, a very effective workplace. But this chap was in tears because he hadn't realised how much damage uh, that had been done to the environment, you know, whether it was acid rain was his, was, his, was, his, was his description. And now looking at the work that we were beginning to do and engage in, and, and seek uh, ideas on, his uh, vision for um, uh, the future and actually being able to put something back into the environment to, to look at addressing those, those, those challenges was something that quite literally moved him to tears. And that really struck me with the responsibility that all of us has as, as a large organisation of, of, of what we must do and be sensitive, sensitive to when we move and work in an area. And to me, that comes really to the heart of what telling a story is about and that, 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 that identity. So this starting of the process was very much about what we do outside of the red line, what, it, what, what, what interaction we have within the area and the connectivity in the network. The next stage is obviously to, to, to start imagining what we do within the red line. Um, and and by, by now we're at uh, the, the early part of 2019, uh, and we've started to develop a vision for the site, which was about retaining its natural uh, uh, qualities. It's about re reconnecting the town into the use of the countryside park so that it has access to the river, which has been closed off uh, to it um, um, uh, in, in, in previous years. It was about what is the local need for, for both housing and employment, how to encourage economic development and economic investment through, 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 through housing development, i.e. to provide a, 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 a good environment for people to live and work in. And very importantly, and, and this is something that is very much uh, uh, recent news, the, it was a award, an award for an all through school. So the proposal to the scheme at the central section now has a, a two form entry primary, for five form entry secondary and a nursery attached and linking in with the sort of the universities and the environment that whole education piece is very much obviously speaking to the to, to the future um, <clears throat> so the um, kind of products uh, that, um, that, that that we are proposing at the scheme that are being developed are the uh, you know uh, housing um, uh, predominantly but very much based on principles about how do you make those homes energy efficient? What are the things that make people's lives easier? How do we connect uh, 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 connect the, 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 the homes together to, to have this concept of a, a smart home, which, which some of you will be familiar. But it's not just about what happens on inside the individual homes. It's very much about how communities are integrated. So how do you aggregate and connect those places together so they, they can function effectively so that there's no resource wastage. So we think about the principles of the circular economy whereby uh, resources can be reused and our impact on the natural environment can be very much uh, uh, mitigated. A very key element, again, it comes back to this cultural point um, of, of, of what we're trying to achieve uh, in, in creating the conditions uh, for communities to flourish in is the all through school. Um, and this is the principle about how we can link into further and higher education, how we can ensure that there's a synergy with the curriculum, whereby we are working with the, the immediate environment, uh, working with, uh, the, again, the biodiversity in terms of working with local businesses, in terms of the skills and knowledge needed into the future, and almost provide that kind of a, a, a petri dish or a, a, a test tube environment for the things that we can, can, can support longer term economic growth. So what are the skills that are needed uh, for a green recovery? And how do we build that into the culture and the identity of a place that very much uh, responds to the, the narrative being created by, by, by Staffordshire? Um, another important key element of what we're doing in Rugeley, um, again, is, is, is around the, the entire energy network and the energy system. We're working in a lead consortium um, uh, there, whereby we're effectively mapping out the entire energy network and designing what we call a smart local energy system that looks at how all the different actors, whether it's transport, whether it's retrofit of uh, existing housing stock, can come together and at a town-wide scale, at a district scale, seek to reduce uh, both energy uh, usage and carbon uh, emissions, but also to look at sustainable uh, costs. Importantly, um, we can't do that by ourselves, and, and we wouldn't even dream to, to, to begin to try. 
Um, we, we very much see ourselves as a facilitator between the public sector, the private sector, with the, the, the communities, with the academic institutions. And I think it's um, something that has amazed me around Staffordshire from, from, from day one, is that that network, whether it's Chambers of Commerce, the LEPs, whether it's the county, the districts, how they all interact, the universities. I, mean, I could go on and name many, many organisations. I'll, I'll, I'll miss somebody out and I'll be in trouble for it. But the principle is, is there is it, it has been over the last couple of years such a clear network of ambition, uh, of, of aspiration and expectation of what we can achieve. And it's only by investing in a supply chain and building partnerships and relationships that, 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 that recognise um, what we're trying to do, will we be able to deliver it. Um, and every player has to do uh, their own part, uh, in, in, in my view, in that. And so what I'm hoping for out of today is maybe to trigger some of these conversations. There might be uh, 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 modular me modern methods of construction um, um, businesses out there. There might be people looking for internships or, or training opportunities or looking to deploy or experiment. And really, we want to talk to everybody about how our work can support the uh, the, the, the Staffordshire story. Uh, so thank you. That's uh, that's um, me. Thank you, Chris, for that very interesting presentation. I'm sure there'll be quite a few people that will be asking questions, hopefully. Um, if you will, make sure you use the Q&A function. If you've got any questions for Chris on his presentation, just pop your questions in there and then we'll get round to it at the panel discussion at the end. Thank you. Um, so if we move on to our second guest, Peter Coleman. So Peter is the CEO of Keel-based Cobra Biologics, who are one of two UK manufacturers of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Please welcome Peter. Thank you. And it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure today uh, to talk obviously about myself first, but mainly about Cobra Biologics, which as well as um, Hannah's highlighted, we're involved in the COVID-19 um, vaccine initiative with Oxford. University and AstraZeneca. We are truly an international business and um, as Hannah's highlighted we've been based in Kiel uh, since 1992. So my background is um, I'm from Manchester originally, um, I live out in Cheshire uh, but now having worked in Staffordshire for over 20 years now uh, I do regard it as my, as my second home. Um, I'm an accountant by training, I've got an MBA from Manchester Business School and um, I've been at Cobra for 20 years. Initially, I was the finance director, but I took over as CEO. My, my 10 year anniversary keeps popping up on LinkedIn this week. And it's been an absolute pleasure to, to run the business and, and see it grow and come to fruition over the last, um, last period of time. So we, we were founded um, on Keele University back in 1992. Um, people often ask me why, why we located there and it's pretty straightforward, the founder actually had a farm around the corner and he thought it was pretty convenient if he could if he could go into the office and just walk around the corner and, and, and start work there. So we were the first organization on the Keele University Science Park uh, and, I, and I think we are actually the largest employer um, on there. In terms of what we do, uh, we were set up in 1992 as a, as a what's called a gene therapy business. So this is a it's an iteration of the pharmaceutical industry, um, which historically relies on chemistry. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, biotechnology came to the fore, which used it, uses biologics material to treat illnesses. And nine out of the 10 top selling um, pharmaceutical products are antibodies or proteins. Gene therapy is, is the next, next wave of products in biotechnology, whereby rather than alleviate symptoms of illnesses, you're actually curing them by introducing biologics materials like viral vector or, or plasmid DNA um, to actually cure illnesses uh, and, and rectify genetic disorders. So we were one of the first organizations in the world to do that. Uh, in 1998, we, um, because of the a loosening of regulations around the services that could be provided in this area, we started to tell our manufacturing services. So organizations who have a great idea um, and maybe a product that they want to get through clinical trials and get onto the market, they're able to make small amounts of plasmid DNA or, or viral vector. Uh, they come to organizations like Cobra 
return myself for CDMO, which is a contract development manufacturing organization. And our objective is to make more of that material, enough material to go into clinical trials. And ultimately, if the products are proved, enough products to be able to treat illnesses worldwide. Um, very rapidly, this business grew uh, from 1998. And since 1998, we've been a truly global business. If you look at the statistics, 95% of our business is outside of the UK. So most of our customers either come from the US, um, North America, or we have clients in Europe and Asia. From 2002 and 2009, we were that successful. We did a stock exchange listing. We became an independent business. That's when I actually became the finance director. And we remained as a PLC up until 2009. In 2009, we were acquired by a Swedish business and we remained under Swedish ownership from 2009 to 2020. And during, during that period of time, we, um, we added an additional facility. So we now have two facilities, one in Kiel and one in Mark Fours, and both doing very similar things. Uh, latterly, in, at the end of 2020, um, we were that successful that we were acquired by a US organization called Cognate Bioservices, who were also in the same industry that we, we are. Uh, we do gene therapy, we manufacture DNA and viral vectors. They have a, a separate section of the business. They're able to actually use cell-based therapies for also for the treatment of, uh, of illnesses. In terms of the market itself, uh, this is a billion dollar industry now. There are products on the market which actually are, are cured genetic diseases. They are, you know, some of these are quite miracle, uh, miracle situations where we're children who have a a short period of life or have um, severe disabilities with the treatment of these um, with these products, they are actually able to lead a, a normal life and, and a, a lengthy normal life. So they are really a second wave and curative curative diseases. So that, that's the background to Cobra. Um, in terms of our existence on the Kiel Science Park, that's been extremely beneficial. Um, with manufacturing, once you're established, it's um, it, it tends to be that you stay where you are, but it also our circumstances have helped with that situation. There's a, an access to, to people, both based in Staffordshire and obviously from Cheshire and Manchester and, and the local area. Great access to Manchester Airport so that when um, customers come in from the US, they can fly in and within 30 minutes, they're on the Kiel campus. Um, in terms of expansion, uh, I think we are the only organization, if you know the Keele University campus, there's a number of innovation centers and we've actually occupied all five. We've gone from IC1, IC2, IC3, IC4 and IC5. So it's been a great location to expand the business. We've recently expanded our capability and I'm currently located in IC5 here where we have an extensive office space and a warehouse. And we're currently employing around about 150 people here on the Keele University campus. Uh, great additions. Uh, more recently, there's, there's a hotel just opened a few weeks ago. That's great to bring the customers in, you know, in terms of you can just walk down the road uh, and have a meeting and, and then they can fly off um, into their, to their next business meeting. The business school is fantastic and obviously a location on the Keele University campus is a, is a great location for employees and, um, and everybody else in terms of the organisation. So that, that's, that's where we are. Um, as I say, we were acquired at the end of 2020 by Cognate. From a personal perspective, you know, I was thinking round about, uh, sorry, that was 2019, I apologize. That was 2019. Um, at the end of 2019, I was, I was thinking, you know, how can things, how can things get any better from, from what we've had? And um, I remember in, at, the, um, at the, beginning of, the beginning of March, I was on a, a trade mission to Canada and I started to hear uh, that um, there was this issue in China, um, COVID, um, there was a virus. I, I was paying some attention to it because obviously that's something that we're interested in. But I think we've had this uh, various iterations before where, you know, everybody was telling it wasn't going to have a profound impact on us. But alongside that, uh, we did get a call from our trade association, which is called the BIA. Uh, and we, we get this regularly from our trade associations. There are organizations out there who are looking for manufacturing capability. And um, in this instance, it was Oxford University. They were working on a, on a COVID vaccine and they were struggling to find 
organizations who had the track record and capability to help them scale up what they had as a manufacturing process. So in, in terms of, of scale, we, we operate in literages. We, we operate what's called bioreactors, uh, very similar to the brewing industry where you buy, you introduce um, cells or, or, or other biologics materials into a nice environment, heat them up, and, and you can make lots of them, actually billions of them. And we've got a strong track record in both the manufacture of plasmid DNA and also what, um, what Oxford University are interested in, which is the manufacture of what's called a enovirus, which is a, a very safe um, way of, of manufacturing um, viruses. And viruses are an excellent way of um, infiltrating the body and accessing and creating antibodies, which obviously help in, in the vaccine environment. So we got a call from the BIA. Um, and like I said, we, we've, had, we've had a number of these in the past. Um, and you know, I was talking to the CSO and we were saying, what do you think? Do you think we should be interested in this? And I said, well, yeah, let, let's give it a go. Let's see where, see where it goes. So we, we put a proposal together. And, and I think when COVID hit, I'd have to say, um, my main thought was actually when we, when obviously when we all went into lockdown was, you know, this, this could be a way of actually keeping the business open. We've got critical worker status. This, we, we could keep the business going. We, we, we had general concerns about whether we were able to carry on. We have a, a number of other customers that we were working for. So we, we, we operated under that environment. Um, but once the consortium was formed between ourselves, Oxford Biomedica, which is the other CDMO that was mentioned, um, consumable suppliers and bioreactor suppliers and Oxford University, it became very apparent that this was a, a realistic and serious opportunity. And um, we, we became involved, we, we put our hands up. And the first, the first part of that process was that we received what's called a bioreactor or at the beginning of April, a 200 litre bioreactor. Um, usually we use our own equipment, but the process had been developed um, was expected to be developed in this bioreactor, so we we put it into we put it into the into the right place. Began to work with it, and you know just to give a just to give a backdrop in terms of scaling up processes from the 15 litre scale that Oxford University had up to 200 litre. Ordinarily, that takes years. We're talking about three to four years, but in terms of the decision making process that this consortium was under, um, we we worked very fast. And actually, we were the first organization in the world to deliver a scaled up batch at 200 litre scale. And that batch was improved in a record 109 days. So, you know, in stark comparison to, to the way that the normal operations under, uh, you know, there are very strict timelines with, with pharmaceutical companies. But on this one, it was, a, it was a record time. So our involvement has continued since then. AstraZeneca became involved. I remember our first meeting with, with them was on, uh, the bank holiday, I think it was VE day when, you know, there was some relaxation in the, in the lockdown rules. And that was the first time we engaged with AstraZeneca. And, you know, since then, you know, everybody knows the story there where, uh, you know, we, we've been able to scale up and with, with Oxford Biomedica and a number of others within the consortium, we're delivering millions of batches of this product as we speak. It's not the only thing that we do. We've continued with our business, our ordinary business, supplying clinical material to our other customers. But alongside that, we're also involved in five other different COVID vaccines, which also include a denovirus manufacturer, but we also, we're also manufacturing plasmid DNA for potential DNA vaccines, and also DNA for what's called the mRNA, mRNA vaccine. For example, one of them is the, is the Pfizer vaccine. So it's not the only thing that we're doing. We're working very hard on a number of different fronts in that area. You know, and I'm, for me, really proud of the organization, the way that we stood up, it's not been easy. We've managed to do this in a situation where we've all had to keep our social distance. We've had to protect the staff. And a lot of people have um, obviously been working in that environment, but also a lot of people working from home as well, which is also extremely difficult when, it, when you're also homeschooling as well. So extremely proud, but also privileged that the profile that we've got um, all over the world, really, in terms of what we achieved, um, you know, really outstanding. And it just validates actually the work that COBRA has done in the area over the last 20 years. In terms of our contribution to Staffordshire, 
as, a, as I've highlighted, these treatments are, are cutting edge science. They're not alleviating symptoms. They are curing diseases in, the, in what's called ATMPs, which is advanced therapy medicinal products. And you know the people that work here, you, know, we, you might think it's all PhDs, but it's not. Um, there's, a, there's a world shortage of these types of skills and a lot of them are practical skills. So we're running an apprentice scheme whereby people come in at, at 18 years old. Um, we're also doing MBAs. There's a lot of commercial skills and project management skills. So we're truly um, multidimensional in terms of the talent that we're recruiting. 60% uh, of our workforce is female. And I'm very proud of that. And also the fact that uh, a vast majority of our people are under, under the age of 30. So it's a, it's a very vibrant organization and probably quite unique in Staffordshire. You know, I think there's a lot of skills and um, things and exciting things going on in Staffordshire, but I'm particularly proud of the, the contribution that we're making in that area, uh, in the area that we operate in, but in, in an area that, you know, ordinary doesn't contribute to that area. So in terms of our future plans, we have been extremely busy. Uh, we've had to... Um, We've had to expand the business. When I took over, we were very proud of our revenue back in 2011, which was three million pounds. This year, it's expected to reach. 50, last year, it's expected to it's expecting to reach 50 million, and we're going to grow from there. Um, we then can start our expansion, but I genuinely believe it's not quick enough. You know, I'm very much encouraging our investors to to invest more. Uh, in the old days. In biotechnology, you used to have to spend a lot of money on stainless steel and piping and, and infrastructure. Now we've got what's called a modular build, whereby you can build a, a big warehouse and then you can get these um, these lab spaces delivered on a, on a modular concept. And um, our ambition is to obviously build on the work that we've done over the last 20 years. And, and we genuinely believe by 2020, we could be world leaders in, in what we do building on obviously the work that we've done on the vaccine, but also the work that we've we've carried out at Kiel for over 20 years. So that that that's Cobra, that's an introduction to me. I hope um, I hope it's been clear what we've done. And I very, again, I very much appreciate the time today to be able to explain our story. I'm very proud of what we've done. And I think there's, um, I think the employees here are, um, a lot of them are Staffordshire based. And, and they lo I love the fact that, that Staffordshire is con contributing to a global problem and hopefully by over the next few months or so we'll be in a much better situation. Thank you. Thank you Peter that's fascinating and you should be very proud of your business it is definitely Staffordshire's success story and uh, anything in terms of helping with Covid I think it's brilliant. Um, please can you all remember if you have got any questions for Peter at all just pop them in the Q&A section and he will answer them at the end and um, just to reiterate that this is being live recorded so those that do have to leave early don't worry you will be able to re-watch it and now to our final speaker Fiona Adams so Fiona is head of procurement at Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games Fiona will update us on the programme and highlight the opportunities and benefits for us all in Staffordshire and across the region. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, again, much like the other speakers, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Uh, I hope that you will find this useful. Uh, let me just make sure everybody can see that slide, I think. Yes, no? Gonna take that as a yes. You're fine. Okay, super. Uh, so I'm Fiona Adams. My background actually started in manufacturing uh, and then moved into the public sector about 15 years ago. So I've done everything from furnaces to heating and ventilation to aerospace with joint strike fighter and Eurofighter. So I've, I've kind of covered a lot of grounds. Um, and I have to say, um, one of the most interesting and challenging roles I've had has been working for the Commonwealth Games, particularly in the current environment. So I'm hoping today just to share with you um, some perspective on where we are in the delivery and uh, maybe open up um, opportunities to you that you may not have explored. So if I give you a little bit of background on the Games, um, 
this is a, I like this slide because there's a lot of data on here, so I'll leave it up for a while for you to digest it. But the Commonwealth Games started in 1930 and Hamilton, Ontario was the first one. Back then, there was only 11 countries and 400 athletes. In comparison for Birmingham, 72 nations, 6,600 athletes. So um, it's come on significantly during that period. Uh, and the, the factor that I always take from when I join the Games is that legacy impact. So whenever you talk to people who worked on previous games, they'll really talk about the impact on other regions. So Gold Coast in Australia, um, Glasgow here in the UK, they all saw significant benefits from being part of such a, a global event. So if we look at some of the um, items on this slide, you'll see that while it is Birmingham 2022, Birmingham hasn't kept that um, share all to itself. It has widened it. Um, within the whole region. So we've got Sandwell, Solihull, Cannock Chase, which I know will be close to your own hearts, Coventry, Warwick, Wolverhampton and Royal Leamington Spa. So the spread of where we're delivering the Games events is quite far and wide and goes further than Birmingham. Um, we've got 2.4 billion citizens across the Commonwealth. So that's your audience for opportunities whether it's in case of tourism or whether it's in case of um, economy, jobs, that's the world stage that we are displaying uh, the region to. So, you know, you couldn't get a better platform, particularly given the environment we are now currently with COVID to really sell what the local area can offer. Um, we have very high expectations on ticket sales. We also have a cultural programme, so the Games isn't purely about sport. Um, I think we're all aware that the culture and the arts has been heavily hit because there aren't really any avenues for them at the moment. The Games offers a cultural programme, plus we have Festival 2022. So the stretch is quite far and wide in terms of the opportunities. Potential boost is £1 billion. Now that's based on Gold Coast. If you go and look at any of the other major sporting events, such as Manchester, Glasgow, you'll see that, you know, the whole profile of the um, cities changed after they held an event like this, because it really put them under the spotlight and sort of gave them a different perspective in the world view. And I fully expect the same for Birmingham for the wider regions. Uh, three to one cost benefit, which I think we would all agree um, would look very attractive at the moment. And in terms of my role of head of procurement, we've got an estimated £300 million worth of games contracts. Um, I'll talk briefly about what that looks like uh, in a moment. So our mission um, is bringing people together, improving health, um, supporting the local regions, putting us on the map and being a catalyst for change. The catalyst for change, um, I mean, I've seen this slide a few times, but I think particularly in the last six months, I would say that kind of has taken a different connotation for me. You know, we really are gonna be a catalyst for change because when we talk about the games now, we talk about 2020 being the year of the pandemic, 21, we are expecting, um, you know, and Peter's comments, taken on board part of the recovery. Uh, in 2022, we hope and um, plan for that to be the year of celebration. So that's part of what we're looking for and to help put everybody on the map, including Staffordshire. Providing hope and opportunity. This might sound like a bit of a cliche, but I think it really resonates all the more in the, the current climate we're working in. It is a good news story. I am a black country girl myself, but for me, I'm really grateful to both to be working for the Commonwealth Games in, in such a challenging environment that we they see around the world now, but also that I can be part of something that can make opportunities appear for people, whether that's through apprenticeships, whether that's through jobs, economic recovery, um, a legacy um, charity. There are, there are so many opportunities that are coming to fruition through the Games. So it's it's a real honour to be part of it, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's a key moment for the region's history, major celebration of sport and culture, which I know those of you who have an interest in either of those will have sorely missed in the last 12 months. 
but we really feel we can help accelerate the recovery for the region. So for those of you with a, a real interest in the sports, obviously we're going to share with you some of the events that we've got on. So we've got 19 sports and these inc include eight para sports. So where you see the P, that means there's a para sport. The difference of the games is we're in integrated games. So what you'll have seen in previous events, whether it's Commonwealth or, or elsewhere, elsewhere, is um, there was a separate event for the paras. Ours isn't like that. Ours is completely integrated. It's just another games event, not separate to anything else, and really opens up the opportunities for disability um, and something for everyone to spread across the nation. Venues in or close to Birmingham. So as you can see, it's not all central Birmingham. We've got a number of sites. Also being able to get the universities involved. Uh, that's widened with our um, move from a single to a, a multi-village offering. And in terms of Midland venues, obviously, you know, Staffordshire's here at the heart of it. Can it chase an area of, of superb beauty, um, but absolutely brilliant venue um, for our um, track. Uh, and what we expect from that is to get Staffordshire on the map, both in terms of the event, but the wider tourism and economy. So it will be really great to see Staffordshire as part of that. But then we've gone further afield with Coventry, Wolverhampton, um, the Vela Park is in London and uh, Sandwell Aquatics brand new site. So we are seeing building continue, we're seeing procurement continue, we're seeing recruitment continue. So I think in terms of what the Games is offering, I think it goes much wider than a, a simply a sports event. So recent progress, we continue to recruit. Um, I think at the moment we're probably around 300 people were expected to hit about a thousand, um, continue to build. So we've mentioned some of the sites that are carrying on. Um, in terms of the uh, village, so as you know, that was, um, that's been led by Birmingham City Council uh, and is meant to have been in Perry Bar. That still continues. So those homes will still appear as the legacy from the games. Um, the timing hasn't worked out, unfortunately, for it to be the village. But what has happened with that is given opportunities to three universities to partner with us and offer us a multi-village site. So rather than looking at um, what didn't happen, we're actually looking at what did we actually add to the games by that event. You know, we've turned a, what could have been seen as a, a negative in some fields as a positive to the wider region. We continue to deliver. Nothing has stopped for the games. The funding is still there. Um, I've worked in the games now, pretty much all of my time here has been in a COVID environment. We are on track for our procurement delivery. Um, we are on track for our delivery of the entire games. So while I can't um, hide the fact it's been a challenging environment, um, what we all take heart from is we can make a difference to people out there who really need this opportunity. Um, again, whether it's the jobs, whether it's through the United Charity, whether it's the general economy, whether it's getting all parts of the region on the map and visible to parts of the world that maybe weren't aware, or if they had any knowledge of us, had maybe a different perspective. You know, we are not all concrete buildings, and certainly Staffordshire is a perfect example of that. You know, we are the heart of manufacturing for a long time within the West Midlands. We're actually, we're an area of great beauty um, and significant resource. And as we've heard from Chris and Peter, you know, right in the heart of some key areas within the region, we're doing amazing work uh, and really pushing the boundaries in the how those are delivered. So we're proud to partner with um, Staffordshire and the wider business world. So in terms of our procurement framework, it's worth mentioning, because um, this is unusual actually for games, we are a public sector body. So we are required to follow PCR 2015, which basically means up until the end of last year, we had to advertise in OGE, so to the wider European nations, because we're a member of Europe. Um, if we've started a procurement in that remit, then we have to continue. Um, if we've started it and gone to the market from the 1st of January, 
to be honest, it's pretty much the same, but we don't have to advertise in OGU. We do have to advertise through Find a Tender. So I'll mention that in a, a later slide of some opportunities for you to go and look at. Um, spend thresholds remain the same. Probably worth mentioning for you because I suspect we will have a number of SMEs on the call. There is a consultation paper out at the moment, a green paper on transfer, transforming public procurement. If you're not aware of it, it's definitely worth a read. I'm, I'm sure it's um, not the most exciting thing if you don't work in procurement, but we're quite excited by it. But one of the key things is around the SMEs, the local engagement. Um, at the moment, we're quite restricted if we're over threshold. You know, we can't say we want to place an order purely because somebody's in Staffordshire or we can't target Birmingham. Um, but obviously under threshold, we have a bit more flexibility. But if you look at that paper, you'll see that the government's very much focused on how can they do more for the UK in terms of opportunities and how can we do more for SMEs and target where we spend that money. So I think there's some good news in there that you might enjoy um, reading at least those aspects of the paper. Um, social value, I'll talk on the next slide. Sponsorship, um, obviously, whatever we don't raise in sponsorship comes out of what we can deliver. So, you know, we do have to cut our cloth to suit our means. Um, so, you know, we have a separate part of the business that deals with sponsorship for anybody who's in a position to consider that. And just say our deadline is immovable. I mean, we have moved it a day because of the Olympics. That's not done um, just in isolation. That's all of the sporting events across the UK and the world came together to look at the calendar events and make sure that we could deliver everything to the world in terms of the, the sporting events. So, you know, in our case, it's only moved a day. There are no changes for us. We will be delivering, you know, we are monitoring day by day, everything that happens in COVID uh, and the impact. But at the moment we are confident in our delivery and everything is on track. Social Values Charter, this will probably resonate with quite a few people. Um, at least 10% of our scoring when we tender goes to Social Value and we do review that on a case by case. We also embed it quite strongly within our procurement. So depending on what we do, um, depends on just how far that goes beyond that 10% regardless. Um, so we will evaluate on you know, what you can offer to the local region. We will evaluate on what you've already been doing to demonstrate those skills. Uh, we are looking for jobs, we are looking for opportunities, whether that's directly or through a subcontract in the local region. So that's one of the areas that we look at. And there's a number of reasons why we look at that sustainability. So we are looking to be carbon neutral, um, which is, would be a first for any games delivery. We want to improve the health and well-being, which in the current climate is only more resonant than it, it was before. Inclusivity. So, you know, we've mentioned that um, we're the first integrated. We're actually we're the first games to have more female um, events than, than have been done in the past. Um, the first major sport event in history uh, to award more medal events for women in particular. Uh, and then human rights. Uh, well, wherever you work, public, private, um, we're all aware of the, the modern slavery and the, the impacts we can have with making sure that we get everybody a fair treatment. So that is at the heart of any procurement. And local benefit, I think that kind of resonates from what I've already said, but legacy is a massive, massive part of every conversation you have in the games. Everything that we do feeds from that, that desire to, to show an impact that doesn't just last for the time of the games and when we close the doors, but it's seen for decades afterwards. You know, that's why the investment is there. Government is strongly behind the games for that very reason. Um, so we hope that some of you on the call will share in all of those um, values and get to see and take part in some form as we go forward with our procurement and our delivery. So uh, just worth sharing our games partners. So obviously Birmingham City Council, you're aware of. Transport for West Midlands and Sandwell because of the Aquatic Centre. So um, some good partners, um, and it goes further than this. So we do partner with, um, such as today, the Ambassadors, the Chambers, 
So there's lots of opportunities for us to engage and we try to make the most of those. In terms of procurement pipeline, obviously we've let a lot of contracts, um, but just to let you know, there's still a lot to go. Um, our team are working incredibly hard along with our stakeholders. Um, so as you can see, significant spend to get through. Uh, this is some links to our business portal. So I mentioned where you can see the opportunities. Um, find a tender and um, contracts finder are used across the UK, contracts finder in particular by all public sector. So if you're looking for opportunities within the public sector, not only with the games, but everywhere else, um, they spend billions of pounds across the UK. Please make sure that you're monitoring contracts finder. If you're not familiar with it, go and have a look. It's completely free. Um, you can register according to your category and get alerts and consider not only what would be an opportunity for you directly, but consider if you've got subcontract opportunities. So if we've already awarded a contract, there is nothing stopping you making con a contact with the awarded bidders to see if there's any subcontract opportunities there for you. Um, it depends on what's been let and whether they're allowed to subcontract. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, social value is a big part. So showing that engagement with local communities is, is essential for us. Um, the Birmingham um, Find a Tender, sorry, the Birmingham Find It Birmingham site is bespoke to us, but there are Find It across the UK. So that's somewhere else that you can look. And then find a tender is what has re um, replaced the OGU TED. So if you're not aware of that, that's where all the public sector across the UK are required. So there's now two sites for public sector to go to, find a tender and contracts finder. If you need any more information on that, there's another slide that I can share um, and I can send after the event that shows you some of those sites and where to look for. So coming soon, you know, we're not stopping with what I've just talked about. We've got a tourism trade and investment program. This is really focused on both um, boosting, sorry, the region's reputation. Um, we have a cultural program. So we've got a six month festival. So that goes from local commissions to, you know, that really at the heart of the community. We've got a learning program for young, young people coming up. We've got the Queen's Baton Relay, so that goes across the Commonwealth, but then we'll travel across the UK and certainly the local region. So real opportunities to raise some excitement and awareness. And then volunteering, 12 and a half thousand volunteers. Um, and, you know, if you think back to the Olympics, we'll all remember those pictures of the, the smiling faces, the local communities and personalities. We want that for these games. We want to see local faces and local accents. So if you're not aware of the volunteers, please go on the website, share it with your friends and family on your Facebook, etc. It's a, a really important part for us, for everybody to feel part of this event. Um, and that brings me to the end of my slideshow. I hope that's interesting to everybody. Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. That was very interesting and great to hear how people can get involved with Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. Um, thank you to all those that have been putting questions in the Q&A section. Please keep them coming. Um, we will be going on shortly to the panel discussion. Um, I think you will all agree that we have got some great projects, initiatives and developments that are taking place in Staffordshire that all link perfectly to our new Staffordshire story. So before I ask our speakers to join the panel discussion, I would like to welcome our new Place Brand Manager, Louisa Grocop, to briefly introduce herself. Louisa started this role only yesterday and will be leading the implementation and rollout of our new Staffordshire story. And I know she's really looking forward to meeting with you all very soon. Please welcome Louisa. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and, and thank you for, for all of you who've joined us today. Um, it, it's really great to have so many people engaged and, and, and on the call. Um, I'm not going to spend too long uh, giving you my life story, but I'll just give you a bit of my background so it gives you a flavour for, for why I've applied for this role and, and, and hopefully why I'll, I'll be doing my utmost to, to do a good job uh, for you all. So I've... Um, I've, I've got a lot of experience in, in place um, 
placemaking and destination marketing, having spent near enough a decade in, in Birmingham in the Midlands doing that for some, some major schemes. So the, the new regeneration scheme in, in Burton, uh, in Branston Lees, um, but also uh, a, a large kind of regeneration of Birmingham city centre. So I did a lot of the uh, PR and marketing of the Paradise uh, regeneration scheme for those of you who are, who are familiar with Birmingham City Centre. Um, but I am, as you'll tell from my accent, um, and I know as, as, as Hannah explains often, I am a true Stokey. Um, I, I am Staffordshire born and bred, um, and I, I moved um, to, to Birmingham to do my degree and, and then stayed on for work afterwards, but was always very mindful um, of my desire to move back, both to make a life in Staffordshire uh, my family, friends and, and, and partner are all from the area, um, but also desperate to work in the area that I that I love and have grown up in. Um, and that was something that for a time um, was a challenge. So having this opportunity to finally bring uh, where I choose to call home uh, and also my working life together is a real passion. And I believe very strongly in the key themes that we've pushed out through the Staffordshire story in terms of giving people opportunities to live and work. And again, you know, harking back to, to the presentation from, from Peter and talking about, you know, young, diverse workforce. That's absolutely everything that I believe in. Um, and through working with the Place Board uh, and Hannah and the rest of the, the team on the Place Board, but also growing the ambassadors group, you know, a real focus for me will be driving that diversity um, of, of people who choose to to live and work and play and visit the attractions here um, and also for growing business. So I'll, I'll finish there, but thank you very much for your time. And as Hannah says, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to meeting and working with you all over the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. I think we'd all agree that it's great to have you on board and to hear your passion for our county. That's just what we need. So I would now like to ask all of our speakers to join the panel and our host Christian for this section. Um, if you do have any more questions, please just keep adding them to the Q&A section and we will do our best to answer them. So over to Christian. Christian. Thank you, Hannah, and good afternoon, everybody. I think we've had uh, three fab presentations this afternoon. Great to hear from, in particular, Chris at NG. That's a hugely exciting development down at Rugeley, and hopefully we'll model for our zero carbon future. But I think what struck me most around that was the when when Chris talked about the clear network of ambition and aspiration in Staffordshire and how partnerships and relationships are going to be really central to, to delivering success down there. Also great to hear from, from Peter at Cobra, uh, real Staffordshire growth and success story, cutting edge science right here in the county. Uh, an incredible achievement really to, to shorten that manufacturing process uh, down from, from what usually is years to, to hundreds of days. Um, and finally, I think the Commonwealth Games is, is going to be an amazing opportunity for, for the whole West Midlands, not just from kind of the sport and activity perspective, but also in terms of jobs and volunteering and all those business opportunities, as Fiona explained. Um, but thanks. We had loads of questions coming through from people today. Got one to start off with, uh, which is open to anyone in the panel who wants to jump in. That's from Ian Kelsall. He's asked, um, well, he's basically started off by saying incredible work from Cobra Biologics. Very proud to be in the county that's leading the fight against COVID-19. Thanks for all you're doing. Um, I believe that digital transformation, stroke enablement uh, and mental health are going to be two huge sectors going forward. What other sectors do the panel believe are great opportunities for Staffordshire to showcase as a county in a post-lockdown world? Shall I? If it, it seems we started to jump in first? Cobra, shall I? Shall I? Can I sure. come in? Sure. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, obviously the industry we're in is scientific, but it's also manufacturing. And I, and I think the bedrock of Staffordshire has been in that area. So I also, I work in the, for, in the UK, uh, in, in the life sciences sector, sector encouraging the government and, 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 and local authorities to, to encourage manufacturing to be based in, in these areas. Because as I say, if you, if you can establish you can establish that capability uh, with a good environment in terms of grants, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you're likely, they're likely to stay 
and you can see that, that the Staffordshire itself, you know, has got a strong history and the people, you know, have a strong association with, with that area in, in manufacturing and in many different areas. Thanks, Peter. Anyone else like to come in? It's not a um, direct uh, uh, response to the um, the question, but I think there's an interesting point um, around how digital transformation, mental health and manufacturing can actually work together. Um, I think one of the things that um, uh, Staffordshire is, is unique in is um, um, the, 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 the ability to, 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 to look at technology and innovation as a positive. And I think we've seen some trends, um, certainly I think there was a recent story in Japan about how uh, working with uh, automation there's been an increase in employment within uh, the care sector. So um, um, by, by, by having uh, automation or robots for another term do activity, um, there's actually been a greater focus to, 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 to on the high value uh, and the things that really need human interaction. I think there's a, there's a quite a unique blend in, in Staffordshire that isn't afraid of the future. Uh, and I think is, is gonna be quite innovative in, in bringing forward some of those things. And though that requires a, uh, intense digitalization and, and, and recognition of the importance of well-being. Thank you, Chris. Hannah, anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to back up Peter about manufacturing, obviously, because that's my sector. And, um, you know, I do think it's quite important. Obviously, ceramics, I'll hark on about that. But um, Staffordshire isn't just about ceramics. There's far more um, different sectors that are really important out there. And I think the one thing about Staffordshire that makes us a little bit different, I think we're really good at working together, actually. I think most, in my experience, sitting on the chamber, sitting on the lap, sitting on all these different organisations, and we do communicate and work really well. I think that makes a bit of a difference and hopefully that'll help us to promote Staffordshire in the place by just working together. So it's just reiterating that I think we've got a lot of great things to shout about really and a lot of great sectors in Staffordshire, that's all. Great, thank you, Hannah. I've got a couple of questions next then, specifically for, for Chris. Uh, first one from Angela Henry. She's asking uh, what timescales are realistic for the initial phase of something on the scale of the, the Rusley development to become reality. Um, and then a follow up from that in terms of Tony Johnson saying, great presentation on the former power station site. Uh, how do you see the existing town centre being linked to the new development? Okay. Um, so time, time scales. Well, um, so I mean, obviously these are these are big projects, um, and and you have to start with a vision, uh, which I think we 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 we've done, and then you have to have a very clear plan about how you how you progress a, a, on those individual steps. Now, in truth, we've actually started it. So the the, the demolition activity that's underway, we're looking to um, bring down the cooling towers later later this year. Um, remediation contracts are progressing, so we're cleaning up the, the ground. And we're, we're trying to overlap and, and bring forward uh, a, a critical mass as early as possible. Now, what that means, um, together with the school delivery, is that we're looking into 2023 for, for some of the first buildings to be um, um, uh, delivered. Now, I've got to say that within these big schemes, they can take five, six, seven years to get started. Um, within Rugeley, we because of the, what I was saying earlier about the importance of having a story to follow the change in use, we closed down in 2017. We started engaging in 2018. We put a planning application in 2019 and it was improved in 2020. That is enormously rapid and that was only possible because the shared vision was a vision between, you know, the district councils, the county council and so forth. So we, we, we have moved at quite an astonishing pace for 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 development um and it's really important we keep the momentum now so um we are we are employing we are moving forward we are designing we are open to new ideas uh, possibly open to too many new ideas but um so that that's 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 kind of the starting point the end point uh, for a scheme of this scale we're looking to 10 to 15 years but to be honest that's just the building phase that's kind of the boring bit in some ways it's it's how you create the foundations for a future economy, growth, and uh, uh, the educational components, all of those things. It's, you know, always uh, uh, ongoing. Um, the second question, apologies, I've forgotten. Oh, the town centre connection, yes. So um, the, the 
a huge amount of effort has gone into how do we ensure that there are physical connections. So we've, we've negotiated with adjoining landowners, including uh, the county council, to ensure that there is sort of free passage between the town centre and the Riverside Park, so that there's a draw. And those things are about, well, why would I go to Rugeley? What can I do? What can I visit? So there's a physical connectivity piece. There's about nature trails and all sorts of things around that. There's an energy connectivity piece. Uh, which is how we're looking at the overall network, but there's also the, the economic connectivity. So what are the, 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 the economic opportunities in the town centre that can su be supported by the new development and vice versa? What can the new development can do to meet a need in the town centre? So it, it is that, that, that principle of connectivity. So we, we, we've, we've worked with the physical points, we're working through the economic points. Um, uh, hopefully that answers the question. That's great, thanks, Chris. Um, and a couple of questions then to bring Fiona back in, some specific ones around the games. Um, first one's from Nick Hardy asking, that you mentioned, uh, Fiona, 300 million in contracts, uh, but just how much of that will filter down to SMEs in the Midlands? Uh, and do you have a plan to keep as much spend as possible in, in our area? Yeah, so as I mentioned, because we are a public sector body, we do have a, quite a, a number of restrictions on us. So we have to go to the market. Um, and offer it and it's open to anybody to bid so we can't target and say we're only giving this for Birmingham or for Stafford if it's over those threshold levels what we are doing is where it's under the threshold where we have more flexibility um, we are putting the um, influence on all of our um, stakeholders within the business to look for local supply um, and we do um, report back to our boards on that. It is a critical part for us. So we do capture about SME and um, how that's looking. And we are always looking for opportunities to increase that, not only for SMEs, but for any wider diversity as well. So we are looking at ways we can capture the whole range of our supply base so that we can look at what else we can do. So in regards to the SMEs, um, the advice that I gave earlier about looking at Contracts Finder, um, and find a tender. So contracts finder, um, civil service, anything over 10K they have to put in if they're advertising um, and everybody else, anything over 25K if they're advertising. Obviously, if they're using a tender or they're um, selecting from a framework, that's slightly different. But actually, if you look at those sites and you register, I think you'll be surprised how many opportunities are actually there, not only for the games, but the entire public sector. So I'd really strongly recommend looking at those. It will not cost you anything. Great, thanks Fiona. And a couple of kind of more practical questions. One asking, are there any spectator tickets available for the games yet? And another, have you got any details around the torch relay and how it would benefit local towns and cities? Yeah, so um, tickets due to go on sale in the summer um, and they will be, um, they're purposely being targeted for being affordable. Um, and the full route for the QBR uh, relay is, is being designed as we speak, um, but it starts its journey in October. Um, so watch this space for further announcements on that. I think that's why they've put it on the last slide, to be fair, because I think, you know, we're still building the momentum to where that goes. Great. Thanks, Fiona. OK, more general question to, um, to everyone on the panel. I'll probably come to you first on this one, Peter. I think you touched on it a little bit in your uh, presentation. But a question from James Leavesley asking, uh, what makes Staffordshire a unique place to operate your business from? Um, I think I, I touched on it when um, when I went through why, why Cobras stayed where we are, actually. There's a there's a there's quite a unique combination of the the workforce is mixed. We we have a, a lot of a lot of people who've been with us for a long time. You know the people the Staffordshire people tend to be very loyal and dedicated uh, and stay and stay in the area. Um, it's it's proximate to world leading universities. Um, Staffordshire University, Keele University, but there's also Manchester and, and Liverpool. Um, great uh, great transport links the motorways trains crew great to get to london there uh, there and back and also manchester airport so there's, there's a number of different factors why uh, why we we retain our base in staffordshire thanks peter can i come to you next hannah 
knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> I would completely agree with everything Peter's just said, to be honest. Um, I do think it's, I think it's the people. I mean, I've worked all over the place in different countries and just staff as your people, I think, are really passionate, creative individuals. I think we just need to shout a bit more about how great we are. Um, obviously, from my point of view, talking about creativity, being the ceramic industry, our heritage, you know, all of that is very unique worldwide. So I, I think we have got a unique story to tell, um, my point of view. That's what I would say. Does that help? Thanks, Hannah. Chris, would you, anything to add? Um, I, th I think for me, it's... Um... Two things. It's it's the you know as not a stokey, so apologies, but uh, um, my my observation is 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 the values. So I've never been so struck by strong values, whether that's the organisations like Kill University and, and and obviously the counties, but uh, the county, but um, most of the partners have a real uh, focus on on things like social impact, well being. These are these these are genuine themes, not 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 sort of tick boxes. And then the other side of that for, 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 that I've seen is really valuing biodiversity and the natural environment. Um, th those two things seem to me to be very, very strong recurring themes and have made for us, you know, Staffordshire a very, very special place. Thanks, Chris. Okay, the next question is probably one more for me uh, and Louisa. It's, um, this comes from David Primrose, who's said, it's great to hear and see the gender and age mix if we are Staffordshire. How's the messaging addressing other aspects of diversity so that everyone knows they are welcome in Staffordshire? Uh, and I think that's a, a great reminder and a, and a good challenge. Uh, probably what I'll just say at this point is, is the diversity angle is something that we've looked at extensively through the research and development of the new story uh, and all the supporting imagery and language that's been going out uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, we are at the start of this project and, and Louisa, one of her uh, first uh, tasks uh, as she settles into the role is developing our, our annual uh, marketing plan uh, and ensuring that diversity uh, is writ large in the plan is going to be key to, to its success, not least because we are uh, all right on the um, edge of the, you know, the great the, the Birmingham conurbation, it's usually cosmopolitan area as well. Uh, so we absolutely do need to, to get that message out that everyone is welcome in Staffordshire. Okay, next one, a question again from, uh, or for Fiona rather, from Richard Swancott, uh, enjoy Staffordshire. He's asking, how can Staffordshire hotels and other accommodation businesses put themselves forward as places for athletes, officials and games visitors to stay? So for the athletes and officials, you can't because that has to be a very controlled environment, obviously because of security. But it doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for hotels because obviously there'll be a lot of tourism generated from this um, so if you want to drop me your details I'm happy to pass that on to our lead on accommodation and see what the plans are for that um, in terms of the, the travel and tourism that we mentioned is coming up so I suspect it will fall out of that program um, but you know we're still waiting for the full details as well. Great thanks Fiona. And then I'm going to come back to you, Chris. A couple of questions. The first one from uh, Professor Trevor McMillan up at Keele University. Um, quick question saying, are there any regional gaps in the supply chain for sustainable stroke smart community development that we should be looking to fill? Well, I think um, I think the gaps are probably beyond Staffordshire. I think it's a general a general thing. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I think the, the clues in the question, sustainability, expertise, um, issues around you know practical implementation of, of circular economy, so forth. Uh, I suppose I'd, I'd kind of categorise it by calling it um, engineers with 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 imagination, uh, engineers that can dream, perhaps. Um, um, uh, there, there's, there's there's fantastic work um, going on in the construction. Um, business and the design areas we just need to bring those things and really embed principles of sustainability so I think it's more about the skills that are needed um, in, in, in what we imagine the future economy could look like. Um, Thanks Chris and another one for you from Claire Pinder-Smith she's asked uh, has NG explored how they can support in T-level development and delivery? Um, Yes, uh, uh, early stages of um, it's something that um, is is very important that we we are really really committed to the principles of ensuring that there are all of the pathways 
um, to, to, to excellence, um, whether it's academic, whether it's uh, vocational, whether it's practical, whether it's business savvy, whatever it may be, there is a, you know, there is a role. And it comes to the diversity inclusion point as well. You know, great people come in all shapes and sizes and, and, and you don't want to let a single person slip through the net. So I think T, T levels are an important part of that, that, that discussion. And um, the regional network is actually very collaborative between FE and HE opportunities. We've been really pleased by that. Again, happy to talk more on any of these topics um, if people want to get in touch direct. Thanks, Chris. Um, I've got a, another question here, and I'm going to come to Hannah on this one first. Um, how do we prevent the naysayers from talking us down from lofty expectations and inspiring ambition? Um, mentions about the press at times being very negative uh, and one of the challenges that we'll need to, to overcome. So, so how would you go about that, Hannah? I personally think it starts with ourselves. I think um, being someone that's lived outside the area, coming from the area, I think we're the first ones to put ourselves down and that's the problem. So people start listening outside and start thinking that it's true. I think if we start to change the way we talk about our county, it will have that natural effect and flow and people will start seeing how amazing we are. That's why you know, this this kind of initiative is so important and we need to all come together and be one voice and be very clear that we're very proud of where we're from. We've got great so stories to tell. I mean, we've just listened to three here and I, I hear them every day. Being part, I'm very fortunate being part of the chamber and being part of the let that I hear some amazing stories and amazing businesses out there that just don't promote and sell themselves. So I think, you know, if we, if we just talk about how successful we are it will naturally change the way people perceive us and I do think that yes sometimes the press can be a bit negative but they're getting that from somewhere so if we're being positive they're going to be positive so I think we've got to just go along those lines. Thanks Hannah. I think just conscious of time I think we've got time for a couple more questions so I'm going to come to um First, Peter, a uh, question from Dan Igonbera, who's uh, said, thank you for the presentation and congratulations for the amazing work you're doing. Uh, my question's about community representation in the industry and how could we improve representations of Afro-Caribbean uh, in the industry? Um, well, I, th I think generally it's, it's that opportunity, giving, giving people um, a diverse backgrounds that, that opportunity generally across the board as I say we it's the university setting um, graduates coming through um, but again I'm a strong advocate of the um, of the apprentice apprentice scheme that, that we take part in uh, it's open it's open to everybody um, um, and I think you just have to you have to keep working on it and um, and developing that thanks Peter Okay, and probably just a final question, and this comes from uh, Philip White at the County Council, so I have to make sure I ask this one on his behalf. Um, he says, that I expect that all three presenters will have had to persuade new recruits to come and work in Staffordshire. How did they sell the area, and how could we all help each other to do this better? I'm going to come to Hannah first. I didn't think I was going to be asked because I'm not done a presentation. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm more focused on people within the area, if I'm honest. I'm more focused about inspiring and getting people to think they can better themselves and trying to encourage people that my industry is an industry to go into and not dying as people think the strong industry is. So I think I, I, I look at it more as keeping recruitment within our local economy and trying to encourage people to do that. And the way I'm doing that is trying to transform the way people perceive my industry a little bit. It's not being so backwards and old. I'm trying to be much more contemporary with the ceramic center here and how I manufacture and everything I'm doing at the moment is all to try and put my industry in a completely different light and trying to I try and work with a lot of young people and schools to try and encourage change the way that children think about our industry change the way that their parents think about the industry that there is a future and you know it can be exciting it can be creative and and that's the way i kind of focus and try and combat that issue i suppose okay thanks Anna. right i'm conscious of 
time and we are rapidly running out of it. So apologies for anyone whose question I haven't asked directly. There have been a couple of requests as well uh, for people for contact details. So I'll pick those up and come back to people separately uh, after the event. But uh, if I hand back to you then, Hannah, to, to kind of sum up the event. Um, yeah, it just remains for me to thank our um, contributors and most of all you for giving up your time. I hope you will support this new approach and feel energised by the incredible developments and projects you've heard today. The real power of the Ambassador Scheme will be hearing about the new, new initiatives, developments and success stories from the people that are making them happen. And alongside this, you will be able to create relationships that will benefit you and Staffordshire, influence and learn about the place, act as a spokesperson for it, and perhaps to develop initiatives with each other. A key next uh, step for the place board and for Louisa will be to develop an implementation plan and tools for us all to use to help to get our message out about our fantastic county to the right audiences. We will have an update on this at the next meeting. Finally, we'll be sending out the recording of today's session with Louise's contact details and information at the next ambassador meeting that will be taking place on Thursday the 1st of April. So make sure you all put it in your diaries. I hope you've had a great day and remember to tell someone something positive about Staffordshire and don't forget to use the hashtag, we are Staffordshire. Thank you very much.